Welcome to Discovering the Northwoods from the Manitowish Waters Historical Society. We will take you on a journey through our local history with the help of primary source documentation. To learn more about this rich history or about the Historical Society, check out our website at mwhistory.org for blog posts, show notes, and our YouTube channel. As with many historical works from this era, there are phrases, terms, and descriptions that are inappropriate to our modern sensibilities. The Manitowish Waters Historical Society in no way condones these offensive remarks or passages, but chooses to read this publication in its entirety for educational purposes and accurate historic context. We would like to introduce Birching into the Big Woods Part 2 by G.O. Shields. The original source is from December 1906 publication of Shields Magazine. Birching in the Big Woods, Part 2, by J.O. Shields. The next morning, we took the camera, the rifle, and the fishing rod and started out with our hearts full of anticipations and our stomachs full of broiled trout, bent on enjoying several sorts of fun. And we had one kind that we didn't order. We had gone but a few hundred yards when a stiff wind came from the southwest. We were headed northeast, so we ran before the wind for a mile or so, but it kept freshening up till it became a gale. The waves were white on top, and we were a little frightened, though neither cared to acknowledge it. Even Clark's dog, a beautiful and good-natured little water spaniel, which could outswim a black bass, seemed uneasy. He looked wistfully towards the land and then at us by turns. Probably his only fear was that we would be drowned and that he would have to walk home, for he was mighty fond of riding. Clark and I would have been willing to give our best gun had we been on dry ground during that storm, but we had to stick to the birch. Finally, we reached the point of an island, and I called to Clark to head her into the lee of it. He said it was dangerous to attempt to turn into the trough of the sea, but I told him it was more dangerous to try and ride it out. By this time, we had cut the point of the island, and with a mighty sweep of the paddle, Clark brought the canoe up and ran her through the worst of the surf. But the very last breaker we had to pass was too much for the frail little craft. The wave caught her amidship, raised her onto the foaming crest, and turned her bottom side up, throwing the whole cargo into the freezing water. We were within 20 feet of the shore but the water where we capsized was at least 20 feet deep. The momentum with which the boat was moving sent her further into the lee after she turned over. Clark was lightly clothed, swam to shore and succeeded by reaching it. But I was heavily clad and had on hip rubber boots, so I could not swim 10 feet. I caught the gunwale of the canoe with one hand as she went over. And when I came up, I clung to the craft with the grip of a drowning man. I called to Clark to look for a pole to throw to me. He glanced about him and said there were none in sight. The dog tried to climb up onto the unturned bottom of the boat. I beat him off and he turned and went ashore. I surveyed the situation rapidly. The lee shore was a mile away. If I should attempt to float there, I would be dead before I reached half the distance. I was already nearly paralyzed with the cold and felt that I could scarcely live 30 minutes longer in the icy flood and chilling wind. What should I do? Must I perish thus miserably within 20 feet of land? But now I'm 30 feet of land. The canoe was slowly but surely drifting out, and I would soon again be in rough water at the mercy of the high winds and sweeping waves. Finally, I moved to the back of the stern of the canoe, got astride of her, pressed her down into the water, and crawled forward onto her with a great portion of my body was out of water. Then I headed her to land and began paddling with my hands for life. It was a struggle between life and death, weakened and half paralyzed. I could make it but a few strokes at a time without stopping to catch my breath. The wind made the canoe dip back nearly as far as I had propelled myself, but I kept up the struggle, maintaining all the time my self-composure perfectly. 
I was as mentally just as cool and methodical all through that dreadful scene as I am in this moment. I have been face to face with death a dozen times in my life, and I have learned not to fear anything until the fight is off. Then, I am always scared stiff. I saw my fishing line slipping across the bottom of the boat, and I knew that the rod and reel were at the bottom of the lake. When the spoon came in sight, I caught it with one hand and set the hooks deeply into the birch bark. All this time I beat in towards shore and the wind blew me back. Finally, by the exertion of greater strength and endurance than I supposed I possessed, I drove the bow of the ship near enough to land so that Clark could reach it. He drew it up till my feet touched the bottom, and when I staggered to dry land and fell on the rocks, much more dead than alive. Clark drew the boat up, righted her, and as soon as I recovered a portion of my strength, I sprang in. My camera, strange to say, was floating a hundred yards downwind. I say strangely, for there is a large amount of brass on it. Enough, I thought, to sink it. We gathered this and Clark's matchbox which had in some way escaped from his trouser pocket, and was floating. And then, the wind having lulled, plied the paddles for all they could stand, and ran with the speed of the tarpon to the old trapper's cabin on the mainland, half a mile away. Clark's conduct in this matter was that of an arrogant coward and I would have been justified in killing him as soon as I landed. There were plenty of dry spruce poles laying about that island, many within a few feet of him. He could easily have picked up one of those and waded about waist deep and pushed the pole to me, but he refused to do it and stood there gazing at me like a graven image. I believe he inwardly hoped to see me drown. When we got ashore, I told him what I thought of him, in words that must burn in his memory yet, if he is still alive. And I am glad of this chance to put him on record as a coward and a sneak of the most contemptible character. Thanks to good old Dick Landford, he had left the door of his shack unlocked and a big box stove was in the cabin. We broke up a lot of dry cedar steaks, filled the stove, lighted them, and about 10 minutes the stove and pipe were red hot from one end to another. We took off our clothes, wrung the water out of them, hung them on the rafters to dry, and toasted ourselves until we were quite comfortable. But here, another calamity befell us. While we were reveling in the gold heat of the roaring stove, the bark roof of the shanty took fire and flamed up like a straw stack. We caught up two tin pails and fairly flew to the lake in the garb that nature gave us, and then back with water. Clark sprang on the roof and I handed him the water. He doused the fire and put it out. Then we sought the seclusion of the shack once more. As we continued our laundry business, we had time to count the casualties of the wreck. My little thirty-two caliber rifle and Clark's axe and rubber coat were at the bottom of the lake, but we hoped to be able to fish them up. We rigged some grappling hooks by tying three large fish hooks to the end of a long tamarack pole, and after drying our clothes and eating our dinner, we went back, anchored on the scene of the disaster, and fished for our lost property. Three or four hours, but not a vestige did we find any of. The coat and axe were of no value, but that little rifle was almost as dear to me as my right hand. She traveled thousands of miles with me, had killed many birds and animals, and had made some wonderful shots. Scratches, of course, but still wonderful. So far, as I know, she still lies there, resting in the bottom of that cruel lake. Anyone who may retrieve her will win a big stake if he will notify me so that I may come and get her, for if I ever hear of her being on dry land, I will win her back if I have to pay out my last penny or fight a duel. To be continued. Thank you for listening to Discovering the Northwoods podcast by the Manitowish Waters Historical Society. Make sure to check out our website at mwhistory.org 
for the show notes, which include a full transcription of this episode, photographs to accompany the story, and citations back to the original sources used. Check back soon for part three of Birching in the Big Woods. Thank you for listening.